I would be happy to do that, yes. So why don't we plan for that, okay? Um, I personally uh, do not care for the sight of myself or the sound of my voice being video recorded, but here we all are. So, um, you guys got these slides ahead, yes? Okay, very good. So, um, I like to think about acid-based imbalance kind of like, um, I like to cook and I like to bake. And with cooking, you can kind of fudge things a little bit. Some people like more red pepper, some people like less salt. You can kind of play around with that a little bit. With baking, if you get your ratios off by too terribly much, your cake don't rise, okay? And acid-base imbalance is a little bit like that. If you think about what normal pH level of the body is, it's a really narrow range. It's kind of like, you know, if you have too much baking powder, baking powder, that kind of thing. So that's why we spend so much time on this topic, and that's why you need to get your head around um, keeping an eye on that with your patients. Who's doing um, transition of practice in an ICU setting? Okay, so only a handful of you. That's okay. Um, there may be, well be some of you who go start in your first job for your nursing career in the ICU setting. Uh, as you guys probably know by now, I also work at a very my Joe's bed. But um, we have a lot of new grads here at the ICU, and they are all about that base, so to speak. Thank you. 
Hey Megan, can you turn off the front lights for me, please? Without falling. There you go. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Ready for the next one? Here we go. Okay. 
Well, that is unusual. I'm usually very loud, but thank you for saying something. I appreciate that. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about acidosis first. It's too acidic. Blood is too acidic. Um, tell me a state where you might have an increased acid production on the metabolic side. Think about disease processes that you've been learning about here. Diabetes. What's that? Yep, diabetic ketoacidosis. So patients with diabetes, just like our quiz question, those patients are at risk. <coughs> GERD? Yeah, that's generally speaking, um, yes. So GERD, why GERD? <coughs> we think of GERD as, oh, someone's producing, overproducing stomach acid, or there's a weakness in the sphincter of the esophagus, so they're symptomatic for, right? They're getting excessive um, acid in the esophagus and, and heartburn and that kind of thing. Um, you'd have to, it would have to be pretty extreme um, for it to then uh, translate into an acidosis in the bloodstream. But um, those other two, there's another one I feel like we may have talked about in my Omega clinical, but I'm not sure if you would have talked about it in a lecture here. Rhabdomyolysis. Yes. Yes, rhabdomyolysis. So what's that? Or rhabdomyolysis, excuse me. What is it? Hmm? Rhabdomyolysis. Okay, so I heard muscle wasting, I heard that right, and the whole system is shutting down. What else? What else do you know about rhabdo, which is what we call it for short sometimes? Who, who is at risk for rhabdo? What they're saying. You what just repeat it. Yeah, you can't hear what Oh, okay. Um, you said something about the muscles, and um, yes, go ahead. You asked who is at risk for it, mm -hmm. and marathon runners. Yeah, marathon runners, um, extreme athletes, those kind of people. And can you think about why? If it's to do with acid and something to do with muscles, and you're a serious athlete. Lactic acid. Lactic acid. Yes, because you have elevated lactic acid levels. Okay. So those are possible. Um, those are possible risks for sure. Your lungs, lung syringe. All right, for our diabetic patients. Um, and then the other. <coughs> Thing that we talk about is um, with metabolic acidosis is a loss of bicarbonate through diarrhea or renal dysfunction. <laughs> if the kidneys are supposed to get rid of the bicarbonate and they're holding on to it, that could, um, no, I'm sorry, it's the, I need to get myself back because that's why I need to do this. Um, so the lactic acid or the ketone, the failure of the kidneys, excuse me, to excrete hydrogen ions, right? So then um, you might have a buildup of hydrogen there. Um, has anyone seen a patient in diabetic ketoacidosis? Yeah. Yes? What did they look like? What was going on with that patient? How were they breathing? Difficult to breathe. Heavily? There's a special name for those for that kind of breathing. Do I remember what that is? Co small breathing. Yep. They're, it's labored, it's deep. Um, they're usually nauseated. They often come in having been vomiting for days. Um, Sometimes. Why do you suppose patients go into diabetic ketoacidosis? Just think about your patients that you've seen with diabetes. Maybe they're, maybe they're on like a pump and they didn't have enough calories or carbs or anything like that. Maybe they screwed up their math. Or uh -huh. non compliant. Uh, yep, newly diagnosed. Um, I've taken care of a patient in the emergency department who came in for a totally different kind of problem. And oh, by the way, we did a finger stick, and it was like in the 600s. And we asked him, "Have you ever been diagnosed with diabetes?" And he said, "No," as he was like breathing heavy and sweating and shaking and retching into a bag. And we said, "Well, this other little problem that you came in with, that's not such a priority right now. Right now, we need to get your sugar under control, right?" So, um, you guys, I got to tell you will take care of diabetic patients in your careers who are, I, I really hate this term, but the term that people tend to use is non-compliance with their insulin, with their finger sticks, and that kind of thing. Um, and if they come in with diabetic ketoacidosis, a lot of times it's because they let their sugars get far too high and get too out of control. Um, so those are the things to look out for um, with any patient who's in any kind of metabolic acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. So, you see these patients a lot. 
um, maybe not pulmonary edema so much, but pulmonary disease, COPD that I mentioned before, pneumonia that I mentioned before. Um, these are patients who are retaining CO2 potentially, and that's causing them to go into a respiratory acidosis. Um, has anyone taken care of a patient who appeared to be um, having a COPD exacerbation, that's why they came to the hospital, or a patient with a significant pneumonia? Okay, what do they look like to you? <coughs> What's that? Yeah, yep, they can be confused, absolutely. What else? Very short of breath. Short of breath? What else? Retractions in, in terms of their breathing, and I heard sitting upright to breathe. To Diaphragmatic. Try to recruit more lung expansion there. What else? Yes, they get very kind of fancy and uncomfortable. <coughs> Anybody else seen this patient? Yeah. Prolonged expiration. Prolonged expiration. Why? Because they're trying to get rid of that CO2. Yep, they're trying to put, they take blow off CO2, right? Okay. Um, so these patients, I just want you to think for a little bit about what this looks like. Think in your mind if that patient is taking care of pneumonia. What kind of nursing interventions can you do for those patients? What kinds of things do you do for that patient who's kind of resting, breathing <laughs> hard? What do you do for that patient? Get them to slow down their breathing. Instead of spirometer to try to help uh, keep the, keep their flow going, right, and not let any further junk settle into their lungs. Have them sitting upright. What else? Mouth mm -hmm. care. Mouth care. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Cluster your care because why? Because they get exhausted. That's exactly right. Um, so again, just kind of another thing to think about, either in your clinicals now or going forward in your practice. If you have this patient and you, let's say you get a report in the morning, and they are, say, let's say they're a COPD patient, so we expect their pulse ox to be what? 80s to low 90s. So let's say they're like 91 on their computer's of oxygen in the morning, and you kind of go and you do your test later on the day, and you notice that they're breathing a little harder, they're breathing a little harder, and they're maybe dipping down to like 88, 87, with, and so you bump up their oxygen, but have you, have you actually solved the problem? No. no okay. I, I say this because I this is the conversation I have with practicing RNs all the time too. Is you've you I don't want to say masked the problem because you've increased the oxygen flow that is accessible to them, but it isn't necessarily helping with the fundamental problem. Does that make sense? Okay. So I if I can impart anything to you, it's think about your nursing interventions as something that's going to give sort of in general like immediate relief maybe for some of these things, but it's also your responsibility to try to help figure out what the underlying problem is and get the help that you need and get the attention that that patient needs um, to, if their symptom is worsening, if their pneumonia is worsening, um, if they're tiring out in their respirations, and then, as we'll talk about later, might be candidate for mechanical ventilation because they're getting tuckered out from breathing like that, okay? Um, the other thing that can cause a respiratory acidosis that is less of that picture that you got of that heavy breathing patient is someone who's had um, CNS depression. And I put this picture of morphine up there because what do we know about narcotic, narcotic medications? <coughs> respiratory depression. So if you have a patient who has like a PCA, let's say, and they're getting their <coughs> morphine or their dilaudid or whatever, and they're sleeping, what are their respiration levels? What's that? Slow. Slow. Um, the respiratory rate will be lower. So we start to worry about that with patients with an excess of narcotics on board. So that's kind of the other way that this can go. So just something for you guys to keep in mind in your practice. And again, these are the symptoms that you expect to see. Breathlessness, they're having trouble catching their breath, they're disoriented, they're confused. Um, they, um, Starts with, you know, they breathe fast and breathe fast and breathe fast, and then they tire out. Okay? Um, so these are the patients who might, um, if it gets really out of control, might be a candidate for either mechanical ventilation or BiPAP, which I'm not going to get really into in this lecture, but that's kind of the stopgap measure between breathing on their own and having an advanced airway. Okay? Now we're going to talk alkalosis. So alkalosis is the other direction, it's 7.45 for your pH is considered alkalotic. Um, respiratory alkalosis 
Um, it's interesting because someone said, oh, they're, they're breathing and they're trying to blow off CO2. Well, you can have a respiratory alkalosis almost if you breathe, if you puff out too much CO2. If you're breathing hard and you're breathing hard and you're breathing all of that CO2 out, um, that can get you into a respiratory alkalosis. That one actually is um, probably the more common of the acid-base imbalances that you will see in practice. Okay. Um, and then metabolic alkalosis um, occurs when either base intake or renal generation of um, bicarb exceeds acid production. Basically, you've got too much um, bicarb in the body, and either your kidneys aren't working to clear it, or um, you've um, gotten rid of too much uh, acid from a metabolic standpoint. And the easiest way to think about that um, is somebody who's been vomiting for days. So go back to that DKA patient. They may have been vomiting, but they are in an acidosis state. If you have somebody who's really dehydrated, um, has whatever nasty GI bug is going around, and they haven't been able to hold anything in for days, um, they can actually end up in a metabolic alkalosis state. Think about it, because what do they project all vomiting out? Right, exactly. Um, certain diuretics, because you know nothing happens in a vacuum, certain diuretics which might um, end up making you excrete too many sodium ions, too many potassium, you can also end up in an acid-base imbalance that way and end up in a metabolic alkalosis <coughs> that way. Um, excessive use of alkaline drugs or um, uh, and loop diuretics, I would say, are probably the bigger culprits that you might see. So your um, CHF patients who are on Lasix, for example, and everyone's taking care of at least one CHF patient getting Lasix, I hope, yes? Yeah. Okay, because those are the patients that you have to watch for a lot of things, right? Their potassium level, their blood pressure, and now you've got to think about this business as well. All right, so um, again, if you're in a hypokinemic state, um, your kidneys are gonna hang on to the bicarb also. So um, just kind of keep in mind that everything affects everything else. Um, and the other big thing is with pushing. So you actually, if you're in that hyper, hyper, I'm not going to say this right, am I? Hyper aldosteronism with pushing. That is another thing that can put you into um, an alkalotic state because again, of the effect on the hypermolization of the bicarb. Okay. Um, so if these, so we're going to get a little bit more into compensation in a minute, but why are these patients having these kinds of symptoms, do you think? The bottom two, I think, should, from what I was saying about electrolyte imbalance, what do you think? Because if, they're low, if they have low potassium, a lot of times the dysrhythmias will come along with that, your PDCs, your, your atrial tachycardia, those kinds of things. Um, but what about the, um, and the reflexes, all of that goes on with that kind of electrolyte piece, um, but what about the respiration system? They're trying to hang on to CO2. Yes, exactly. And that gets into that whole um, compensation piece where if the problem is in one place, the other place is what's trying to fix it. Make sense? The reason I'm kind of breezing through these a bit is because I know you've already seen them. Yes, go ahead. So that's a very specific type of anemia where your baseline oxygen carrying capacity is low. Heart failure. Yep. Mm -hmm. What else? 
drowning, yes, you're certainly at risk for hypoxemia if you drown. That's definitely lung disease, lung disease of various types, right? So that's why I remember in the um, um, quiz when I, it asked about uh, are you at risk for as, um, alkalosis or acidosis with pneumonia, and the answer is both. Um, if you think about that disease process, you could potentially be retaining CO2 or you could potentially be trying to blow it off. So either way, you are potentially at risk for an imbalance. Does that make sense? All right, what else? Anything else that we did not cover for reasons why someone might be high What's that? Kidney disease. Kidney disease? Why?
the heart of it. When you are looking at a patient's arterial blood gas, which is not just from the ICU, by the way. Um, if you have a patient, again, think about that COPD -er who was good on three liters this morning, and you've cranked them up to six liters in the afternoon, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't think I'm supposed to do more than about five or six liters in a nasal cannula. What's going on around here? Um, that patient might need a blood gas, just to kind of get a sense of have they put themselves into um, an acid-basic balance state, um, what's the CO2 content of their blood, um, is it higher than 45, in which case we will say that they are okay. um, So, and just, I put these two together, PaO2 and O2 saturation. This is the number you can see with your pulse ox versus the O2 value that you're going to be seeing in an AVG meeting. When we do our practice ones in a little while, we're not really going to be so fussed about um, the millimeters of mercury of oxygen in the blood, but just that will be something that you will look at um, when you're looking at the overall picture. But as far as determining whether you are in a balanced or imbalanced state, um, it would rise and fall and make sense if there was respiratory issues going on, but that's not the kind of, that's not the heart of doing that ADG meeting for our purposes today. But the pH, that normal value, as you guys rightly identified, is 7.35 to 7.45. Handily enough, the normal range for CO2 is 35 to 45, so that makes those two kind of easy to remember, okay? Um, and then the, o, the PaO2 normal is 80 to 100, and your bicarb is 22 to 26. So, if we know that excess CO2 is what makes the blood acidotic, if that number is higher than 45, we would expect an acidosis state. Um, <coughs> I guess we have to talk about compensation. Um, if the bicarb number is lower than 22, what would that be? If the bicarb is a base and it's lower than it's supposed to be, then it's an acidotic state. So far so good? Okay. There are lots of different mnemonic devices and kind of tips and tricks for remembering this stuff and how to actually interpret your ABGs. I'm going to go over a few of them. Um, can't bring it in with you to the NFLEX, unfortunately, but the idea is that if you've practiced enough, you'll kind of have a sense of this when you're looking at those values, okay? Um, this is very hard to see up top up here, probably, but um, this just shows what, um, in a metabolic acidosis, the bicarb is down. In a metabolic alkalosis, the bicarb is up. In a respiratory acidosis, the CO2 is up. In a respiratory alkalosis, the CO2 is down, and it talks about their um, principle of compensatory actions, which really just means how do you balance out the thing that's out of whack. And in the end, they both end up out of whack. So we're going to, you'll see that momentarily. So has anyone, before you saw these, um, heard of the Rome method of understanding how to yeah. interpret the AG? Okay. So I know you have it in front of you, but someone tell me aloud so everyone can hear what it is. That's cheating. I hear the pages turning. <laughs> respiratory opposite. So respiratory opposite, metabolic equal. Somebody else tell me just what was the respiratory opposite part mean? What does that mean? Respiratory opposite means when what's too high. Okay. So if CO can't make my hand into an up arrow, but if CO2 is up, then the, okay, and then the pH is down. Yes. Okay. I think, I, no, I think you're getting there. That's okay. So, yeah, I do. So if, the, <laughs> so if the CO2 number is up and pH is down, that's all that means, okay? Because that's a respiratory indicator of imbalance. So, and then how about the metabolic? <coughs> what does that mean? Someone else? <coughs> What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time? The pH is low. The pH yeah. is low? If bicarb is low, then the pH will be low. Yes, okay, so if the pH is low, the bicarb is also low. So that means whatever direction they're going in, they go together if it's a metabolic issue. All right. So. Now you saw this before, but now does that make sense with my little arm arrows here? Um, the bicarb is going to be normal if it's a respiratory problem. 
and the arrows for pH and PC are two point in opposite directions. That's really all that means. And then <coughs> the metabolic imbalance state, the PCO2 is between 35 and 45, so it's normal. Um, and the arrows for pH and CO and uh, bicarb point in the same direction. That's all that means. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So for respiratory acidosis, the pH is low. CO2 is high, but the bicarb is normal, right? Um, for metabolic acidosis, the pH is still low, the CO2 is normal, but the bicarb is also low, right? bicarb is within normal range. I know I said we weren't going to like fuss too much about the PaO2, but if this is your most common type of imbalance that you're going to see, you might want to think a little bit. What do you think you're going to see in terms of the oxygen? Think about your asthma patient blowing off CO2. Think about your um, anxiety patient blowing off CO2. What do you guys think? What's that? That might be a little on the low side. Low side. All right. And when you have that patient um, on the pulse ox, what do you think you might see? Eight. Something a little lower than probably their norm just because they're hyperventilating. Um, so I was doing a little reading in preparation for this lecture. I promise I did do actually quite a bit of reading in preparation for this lecture. But um, I was reading about the old-fashioned method of breathing into a paper bag. Okay? <clears throat> what do you guys think? Does it work? Is it a good idea? What, how would it work if it works? You're rebreathing the CO2. Why do you suppose they're not really recommending that people do that, though? <laughs> that might be the case. Everyone hear that? You can't make a dollar off of it. Like, you can't um, charge $7 for a paper bag at the hospital. That's possible. But from a, from a, shall we say, patient safety standpoint, why would you not recommend doing that? What's that? It's not measurable. That's one possibility. What else? Okay. So, because people will just like do it at home themselves and end up like passing out or uh, end up too far in the other direction and they end up still like mildly hypoxic because they've been like rebreathing into this paper bag until they pass out. So, um, those of you who may have sort of heard that as something that works, it was interesting because I was like, do they even still recommend that people do that anymore? And the answer is definitively <coughs> no. So the tic-tac-toe method, I'm actually going to be giving you handouts of how this works. It's pretty much what it looks like. So when you look at that blood gas value, you would say, okay, is the pH acidonic? Normal. That says base, but we know that means alkalotic. And then you plug it into where it would be. And same thing with the CO2. Is this CO2 value acidotic, normal, or alkalotic? And same thing with the bicarbonate. Once you do all of that, you should be able to say, oh, okay, the pH is low, so I know that it's, oh, come on, guys. I, the pH is low, so I know it's, there we go. Don't worry, we're coming up on a break in about like 10 minutes. Hang in there, okay? Um, yes, ma'am? Is it possible that you can have both of those out of what? Yes. Do you mean both um, the bicarb and the carbon dioxide? Yeah. And, yes, absolutely. Um, was that no? So you can have, and I, and again, in the interest of keeping it like fairly streamlined for this class, there are such things as um, mixed acid-base imbalance. So you can have because, and again, <coughs> you have already discovered this in clinicals. Most of your patients that have diabetes, for example, or hypertension, don't just have diabetes or hypertension. They typically have a laundry list of comorbidities. So you can have a mixed respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis if you're. A COPD or who retains uh, CO2, and you also are in DKA, right? So you could, and so really, although my focus has, is going to be primarily on how do you interpret the EPG, always keep in the forefront of your mind why is the patient in this state, and what are we going to do to actually treat and reverse the problem? Does that make sense? So, but yes, you can have a mix respiratory, respiratory and metabolic acid base imbalance, absolutely. Okay. 
So remember how I kept saying, oh, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Compensated and uncompensated, what's in a name, right? Um, so sometimes we get a patient who has a pH of 7.1. That's pretty bad. If you figure normal is 7.35 to 7.45, that patient is not doing very well. Um, we will, we, you can actually get mixed an IV fluid bag of bicarbonate solution and we will just pour that sucker into patients to try to raise their um, bicarbonate level and therefore raise their pH, okay? Um, it's typically, a, again, a stopgap measure while you figure out what's actually going on with the patient. But sometimes it doesn't have to come to that. If the problem is metabolic, the respiratory system compensates. And we talked a little bit about what that can look like. Um, particularly, the biggest, like the sort of easiest example that I think you guys are familiar with is that cusmal breathing that you see in um, diabetic patients. <sighs> Deep, <sighs> rapid. Okay, so they're trying to increase the pH of body by decreasing CO2, even though ketones are what's causing the acidosis. Okay. And similarly, if the problem is um, respiratory, the metabolic system compensates. That's sometimes a little bit harder to see, um, although you can certainly have somebody who's um, got a respiratory acidosis and vomiting, I suppose, to try to flush out some of that uh, hydrogen, uh, some of that acid. But um, there's a pretty big difference. One is if you have a metabolic state, respiratory compensation can kick in within minutes. And you'll, again, probably seen this and if you haven't already you will um, where that patient is um, having some kind of renal dysfunction and then uh, or whatever it might be or that diabetic patient or they're there in rhabdo and they're <sighs> breathing and that can actually um, restore some semblance of balance pretty quickly whereas if you have a respiratory problem and um, the metabolic system tries to compensate that can take hours to days so it's not necessarily um, as easy a quick fix. And typically, if you think about, we already talked about the disease processes from a respiratory standpoint that can cause that kind of imbalance. There's some other underlying issue there that generally needs to be addressed. But we can talk about arterial blood gases being in a compensated state. So, like it says up here, if the compensatory mechanisms work, the pH will be normal. You can actually raise that acidotic pH back to within normal limits. Um, or lower it back down from um, an alkalosis state to normal, but then both the bicarb and the CO2 will be abnormal. Does that make sense? Yes. So is that how they that's how they distinguish whether it's compensated or uncompensated? Yes. That's that's it. I mean, it's not quite that simple because then in clinical practice, is that patient going to stay that way? Like, do you need to um, assist them with their breathing so that they can stay you know stay out of that acidotic state if they've been able to somewhat or whatnot, but yes, that when they talk about compensated versus uncompensated, you're looking at basically did the opposite system kick into play? Does that make sense? And that's how you can tell what to treat, like the metabolic. Well, initially, like let's say you have someone initially come in, and again, my point of reference for those of you who don't know, prior to my current role, of course, the Oklahoma State Emergency Department. But the cool thing about that is you get people in these states, and you might have some inkling of why, but you're not sure exactly why, or whether there's multi, you know, multiple factors involved, or how bad it is. So if someone comes in, I'm going to know for sure that we're going to be getting the respiratory therapist in there to draw an arterial blood gas, and that's another thing I want to make sure you guys come away with. As an RN, you're not typically the one drawing an ABG unless your patient, again, is in either the emergency department or the intensive care unit with an, ar with an arterial line for blood pressure monitoring. Has anyone, probably not yet, has anyone seen that? You have. Will you describe what you saw? If you don't mind, and I'll amplify if you need me to, but what did it look like? Uh -huh. In the person. Yeah. The oh, okay. So it's a <laughs> yes. So it's a it's a plastic catheter in the arteries. The same as that was perfect. The same that's in the vein. That's totally fine. And it actually connects um, to a pressure bag, which is just a saline bag full of saline and tubing um, with a pressure bag around it to maintain a certain um, inflow pressure into the artery. Because if you think about it, you're fighting against the actual flow direction of the artery. And that is connected by a cord called a transducer to your bedside monitor. So just as you see wave, um, cleft waves for your pulse ox, you can also see 
waves on your arterial um, monitoring line, and that will actually give you the arterial blood pressure. It's pretty cool. But if you are in a department where the patient has one of those, the nurses will draw ABGs off of that because that is technically arterial blood, so you can do that. Um, but otherwise, if it's a patient that doesn't have that kind of access, the respiratory therapist. Okay. Um, so let's say you have that person, you do their ABG, um, it shows that they're in a respiratory acidosis state, you give them some bicarb, you maybe assist them with their breathing in some way, whether it be um, with steroids or um, other breathing treatments, or you put them on BiPAP, and then you would recheck an ABG to look for what? Improvement, yeah, to look and see if you've actually helped solve the problem, okay? Um, so, what we're gonna do, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, there's another way to um, think about how you're gonna determine what is going on with your blood gas value, um, which is the three names way, okay? Get it, Mike? Has no one thought that we did a good reference? I'm like super upset, okay. Um, so, the first name will be either compensated or uncompensated. <coughs> the second name will be either respiratory or metabolic. And the third name will be either acidosis or alkalosis. But the way I like to think about it is just like when you're looking someone up in the directory, you actually go from last to first, okay? So, in other words, I can't know yet if it's compensated or uncompensated until I figure out whether it's acidosis or alkalosis at all, and if so, what system it's part of. So you would look me up as nine comic Caitlin M, here we're going to be looking this up by um, imbalance system, comma, compensated or uncompensated. Yes. So if when you're compensating, if your pH is normal, mm -hmm. you decide if they were originally exercised or That is, a, did everyone hear that excellent mm -hmm. question? Oh, I will repeat it. And if no one hears, if you can't hear me in the back, let me know and I'll repeat it even louder. If the if the ABG is showing a compensated state, how do you know what the original problem was, essentially? How do you know what the original issue was? So how do you know? Okay, so no, that's great. If it's on the high side or low side, so you're kind of thinking about where is that pH recovering from? Is it, that's, I, I, I like that answer. There's another answer too, yes. Clinical correlation along with the other two results? Clinical mm -hmm. correlation along with the other two results, meaning you want to look at the whole picture, yeah. right? So, but even more basic than that, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm so glad, yes. <laughs> okay, so that's similar to what she said, see that on the high side or the low side of that normal range, because then you can kind of guess, oh, she, we tugged it back in from alkalosis or we pulled it back up from acidosis, yes. Symptoms. What the heck is going on with the patient? Yes, so you have, context is everything. Um, even if someone comes in unresponsive, breathing heavy, we don't know what the heck is going on with them, say on an ambulance, we have some sense of what their medical history might be, what medicines they take, you hope you get some of that, or if they come in as a gunshot victim, or if they come in after a motor vehicle accident, you have some sense of what kinds of things might have put them at risk of having this abnormal ABG. And so that clinical correlation that you were saying, you put the numbers together with what's going on with your patient. That's pretty much the name of the game of pretty much everything in nursing, right? You're never just looking at the vital signs. You're never just looking at the lab values. You're trying to match it with what do you understand to be true about the patient. That DKA patient I told you about was not expecting any abnormal lab work on him at all. He was here for what I thought was gonna be a pretty non-emergent problem, and it turned out to be this whole other thing. And I had to really then dig, do you, do you have diabetes? Have you ever been diagnosed? Have you ever had this, that, and the other symptoms? And he did mention, oh yeah, you know, I do sometimes get tingling in my fingers. And I was like, oh really? So, or you know, sweaty, and I'm like, oh, okay. So then you start to put the clinical picture together with the numbers that you're seeing. That's true for ABGs, that's true for everything. Sound good? Okay. So, if you do the three names system, first question, does the patient exhibit acidosis or alkalosis? And we know the answer to that because of <coughs> pH. If you see a pH that's normal, but you think maybe those other numbers are abnormal, you can kind of like put that aside to yourself in a parenthesis, like, okay, the pH is normal, but let me see what else is going on here. 
the boring side for sure. Keeping an eye on what side of 7.4 it is might be helpful, maybe. Um, and then the second question is, what is the primary problem? Remember that tic-tac-toe grid? That can help you solve that, right, by based on is the CO2 abnormal or is the bike car abnormal? And the third question is the patient exhibiting a compensatory state. So if you go, oh, the bike car is abnormal and the CO2 is also abnormal, but the pH is normal, then you know that it's what? Compensating. Right, very good. So, what I'm going to ask you guys to do, although it looks like you may have gotten this already, I would like you to still practice. I'm going to um, ask you to close up your notes that you may have. And I'm going to hand out the um, sort of practice worksheets. And you can just have these. You don't have to do all of them on your list. You can just do all of them and hang it in. Um, but when I'm going to put these up here and talk about what the answers might be and why. Yes, I'm I sorry to use your key. Which means that, um, so if you're in a metallic state, yeah, I think it was the rest of the answer. Your pH will be normal. So you'll have, you'll have a compensated metabolic and then you'll have to go So if the pH is normal, the other man is off. Yes. And then if it's and then I'm going to do these when we'll take our break. Okay? So, so hang in there, but you can do some of the break. All the way So if you don't have your sheets yet, you don't have to take your sheets yet. You don't have to take your sheets Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm not certain I can pull it off. Do we have clinical this weekend the whole time? Thank you. Our outcome lies up Okay, so then what state are we in? 
Okay, I heard metabolic acidosis. Are we compensated or uncompensated? Uncompensated. So someone who has not answered a question for me yet, tell me what disease state when you could find yourself here. And metabolic acidosis. DKA. DKA, yes. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Number three. The pH, well, you can say the better now, but I'll just keep yelling because I can. pH is 7.51, which is? Okay. The bike, the, excuse me, the CO2 is 40. Okay. And the bicarb is 30. Okay. Uh, so it's a little high. What's the range? The range for bicarb is 22 to 26. So what is this patient in? I'm oh, sorry, I heard metabolic alkalosis, compensated or uncompensated? Uncompensated, how do you know? Because the pH is still high, very good. All right, number four. The pH is 7.45. I'm sorry? Normal. The, PC, the PCO2 is 48. Okay. And the bicarb is 32, which is also high. high. Okay. So, um, and you have a little hint up there about what might be going on. So, what state are they in? Okay. I hear metabolic, I hear alkalosis. Are they compensated or uncompensated? How do you know? Okay. So, you were asking, is that what they mean by compensated? Yes. Your pH is normal. <laughs> Um, those of you who kind of said, oh, well, what if they're on the high side of normal? Yeah, yeah you know. Just so, what, someone, again, I'm going to do this again, someone who hasn't answered a question for me yet, what kind of state might, um, besides what I put up here, what other disease state might cause a metabolic alkalosis? What organ controls bicarb? Yes. Okay. Um, that can kind of go, yes. So let's go down to, and I think I gave you this one actually, but um, pH is 7.44, which is? Okay. The um, CO2 is 25, which is? And the bicarb is? Okay. And tell me what you see up here that you know about this patient. What makes, what are we looking at here? What state are we in in terms of? Acid base. I hear respiratory. What's that? Alkalosis. Compensated. Why? Because the pH is normal. What does this patient look like to you? Shallow breathing. How come? Any other thoughts, any other takers, questions, concerns? Do I see a hand back there? No, 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 All right, we got four and then we'll take our break. <coughs> Number six, pH is 7.42. CO2 is 37. Bicarb is 25. They're normal. So what is this person? Normal. They're normal. Uh, you know, <laughs> I like that word. as normal as we get around here, right? No, they are, from an acid-base perspective, they are in balance. Okay. There isn't, um, like, there's not a homeostasis exactly. It's, uh, Absolutely. They are in balance. All right. Number seven. The pH is? We have guys low acidotic. The CO2 is okay, and the bicarb is okay. So, what state are we in? I heard uncompensated respiratory acidosis. <coughs> so, like, somebody who hasn't answered a question for me, what kind of disease state might this person be in that we haven't talked about recently? What's going on with this patient, maybe? Ooh, what's that? Morphine. Morphine. Overdose. Overdose of morphine. Mm -hmm. Overdose of narcotics. So, how is that person breathing? <laughs> Shallow and slow. Okay. Um, 
just as a quick aside, what is the reversal agent for someone who's had an opioid overdose? Narcan. Narcan. What's the dosage, guys? One nasal inhalation. Okay. Oh my gosh, we could have a whole other class about the availability of Narcan in the community to prevent opioid overdose. So um, that, it, that it is available in the nasal spray form. Um, but when we're talking about, say, in the hospital, that surgery patient who's um, need um, or their, their PCA button hitting exceeds their actual need to achieve good pain relief without knowing them outright, um, it would be 0.4 milligrams IV. It's pretty short acting though, so when that patient sits upright because you've just eaten up all their opioid receptors and they go, Wah! and they're like back in pain, they will sometimes fall back to sleep again within a few minutes. It's really weird, okay? Um, last but certainly not least, pH is 7.24. Acidic, not good. Um, PCO2 is 38. And the bicarb is 19. Okay, so what state are we in? Okay. And I know we already had another metabolic acidosis question. You know, someone said, oh, yes, someone who's diabetic. Um, so what's another possible option? For this person? What's that? Tyorrhea. Why? What else? Oh, diabetes and syphilis. Sneaky. What else? Rapto. Remember the, the your superstar athlete who looks super healthy and then they come in out of it, right? Okay, you guys. I hope that going through these practice ones has been helpful. Um, we're going to take a, you to get 10 minutes, right? We're going to take a break until 6.50. What? <laughs>